Hello and welcome to the Synergia People Podcast 2023. I'm Mark Nelson. I am currently the chairman of the Institute of Ecotechnics. I am also involved in Wastewater Gardens International. I was a biospherian at Biosphere 2 for two years uh, during its first closure mission. And uh, currently I'm helping manage an organic orchard here at Synergia Ranch, involved in projects with wastewater gardens and ecotechnics around the world. How did you get involved with all these other people around Biosphere 2, Synergia Ranch? When did you first meet? Well, it was one of those lucky coincidences. I was looking at some works to do with the inner work. I met a woman who had worked with the Theater of All Possibilities during their brief incarnation in New York City in 1968. And she was on her way out to New Mexico, where they were going to start what became Synergia Ranch. And she gave me the address of John Allen. I was 22 years old, and I wrote him a letter because I, I didn't want to do the conventional career options on the table. And I also was a, a thinking I might need to leave the country because of the Vietnam draft. Everything sort of worked out in a very uh, wonderful way. I came out here for a three-day trial period in October 1969, which extended to a month. And then by then, I could see that this this way of life, this approach – really kind of exceeded expectations. What was this way of life, if you would have to describe it a little bit more? Yeah, I'm happy to describe it because uh, it was music to my ears. Since my family, first generation, really poor, uh, struggling Jews from Eastern Europe who doffed the traditional religion and you know, became idealistic socialists, etc. But they, you know, their program for especially the, the young boys of the family were to become some kind of professional, preferably a medical doctor, if not a professor or lawyer. And so that kind of hung over my head. Now I'm a younger brother, so my elder brother ticked off all those boxes. <laughs> so, which maybe gave me some freedom to think I could do something else. So typically, I took all of the pre-medical courses at Dartmouth College, but I majored in philosophy and partook of the 1960s energy, which which was the birth of the modern environmental movement, so, and yeah. also kind of a turning away that a life of material comfort and consumption was not the be-all and end-all. This Institute of Ecotechnics, which you're still adding today with others. What is it all about? As it was explained to me when I came in October 69 to Sitting Gear Ranch, the idea was three lines of activity, or one being enterprise to support yourself, working on theater, which was kind of like an artistic uh, bond for the community, and also subsidiarily, it's great psychotherapy, group therapy, and of course, a very powerful art form in itself. Yeah. And the third, the third line of work was on ecology. We would pick projects that were in cultural upheaval and ecological crisis or challenge and take on the difficult projects. And the vision of ecotechnics was kind of simple. And we would try to, you know, bring technology and ecology in a much more harmonious relationship. And how did this work out? What kind of projects can you look back on? So I grew up in New York City, and I had never really seen the Southwest. So when I first came to Sinegar Ranch, it was just the most miserablest piece of land that I'd ever seen. I kind of intuited that this was unnatural destruction. And in fact, you know, it's kind of a man-made, desertified situation. So we set a very simple task at Synergia Ranch. Let's take this desertified piece of land and turn it into an oasis. In so doing, demonstrate that a community of people can live intensively and productively and very happily and not run down their surrounding uh, ecosystem. 
How can we do economically viable, not profit maximizing activities while in increasing the resiliency, biodiversity, biomass, the yeah. health of the ecosystems we live in? Do you have other examples? I spent a decade here, you know, basically learning. I had to learn everything since I was a city kid. And then I went to Australia where we had two projects in the tropical savanna. And, and the one that I was you know, most involved in and helping manage was called Birdwood Downs. So by scale, here's Sinegir Ranch, originally 165 acres. And in Australia, we had a very small property, 5,000 acres, that the West Australian government considered to be worthless land. And if we could actually plant and improve pasture grasses and restore the ecology, they would be very happy because they had millions and millions and millions mm -hmm. of acres of similar land. And it, it was, for me, very uh, educational, too, because there's a similar story, overgrazing and misuse of the land in Australia in a really short period, but it was in a tropical uh, setting. That was one of the ideas as a personal education, that we would make a network of affiliated projects. I mean, IE actually doesn't own these projects. It consults to it, its members, directors, etc. take part in it. We make alliances with, with like-minded people. If ecotechnics is a type of medicine, let's call it an earth medicine, we want to take on the challenging ones. Because one, you grow more when you take on a new challenge. Or as we used to joke, there's no rule book. There's no book to go right. by. Nobody had yeah. ever taken 5,000 acres yeah. of the Kimberley. This is the region in Australia. Vast, vast area that has been degraded in an astonishingly short period of time by a very small number of ill-advised enterprises. How yeah. does it look now in Australia? Well, I mean, you know, it it been called the pastoral uh, gem of the Kimberley. So, and, and it was a condition of us getting freehold. We had to plant improved pasture grasses and learn everything about how to run a tropical savanna project with horses and cattle and seasons that are really challenging. I mean, super hot and dry for eight months of the year, very concentrated wet season. We really transformed that property and, and made a demonstration that mm -hmm. it can be done. So how does this Institute of Ecotechnics relate to Biosphere 2? The thing about Biosphere 2 is maybe we haven't done a great job of telling our story. People kind of think Biosphere 2 is like a mushroom that suddenly sprouted in the desert. Well, not really, because the Institute of Ecotechnics had been doing work around the planet in similar ecologies for 15 to 20 years. Institute of Ecotechnics consults to a sustainable forestry project in Puerto Rico. And our research ship, the Heraclitus, which had traversed a, a good portion of the world's oceans by the time of Biosphere 2, you know, so we actually had ground truth, practical experience in a number of the key biomes that went into Biosphere 2. And also as part of the education and mission of the Institute of Ecotechnics, we had started convening international conferences And, and we started with the biomes. We had a 1976 ocean and deserts, mountains, jungles, yeah. rainforest, planet Earth conference. So we also, you know, knew a network of creative scientists, engineers, thinkers that we could call on mm. because Biosphere 2, it's an order, at least an order, maybe two or three orders of magnitude. More ambitious, more expensive, and perhaps more singularly uh, significant than than even the ecotecting projects. What was your goal with Biosphere 2? Oh, let's do a little count here. Number one, we want to make a biospheric laboratory where we could do research on intensively studying the basic processes that operate our biosphere. How does a biome operate? And if you build a rainforest from scratch, how does, it, how does a rainforest interact with an ocean and a savanna? Number two, 
if you make an artificial, a synthetic biospheric system, mm -hmm. you're going to need a lot of technology because a lot of what the Earth and our global biosphere does is excluded. We're going to have an experiment to redesign the technosphere. Let us demonstrate a technosphere that can support life, a biosphere, without polluting and damaging it. Number three, we want to inspire the people of planet Earth about the preciousness of what they take for granted, environmental technologies. Now, if, you, if you're insane enough or inspired enough to want to build a mini biosphere, you're going to have to figure out technologies that help make the system work. Right. So, you know, we anticipated that one of the payoffs for the investors into Biosphere 2 and uh, another beneficial outcome is that we would be on the forefront of beneficial technologies to keep water clean, to grow food intensively without using chemicals and polluting mm. the system. You were one of these eight people yeah. who entered first this Biosphere 2. Why two years? Several reasons. One is that you have a succession of seasons. The seasons in Biosphere 2 were a little bit more complex because we had biomic areas modeled on places very different in the planet. And we had an agricultural system, and it was largely sunlight-driven. So two years meant that we went through the seasons twice. And, of course, we were thinking about eventually – If the human destiny is, as I think it is, our payback to our global biosphere is to seed biospheres, take biospheric life with us, two years is the likely time of a, a Mars return mission. A Mars return. Okay. Yeah. How was your experience? Well, so you had constantly challenges to overcome. What does this do with you? Well, I would say it's about 90% heaven. If heaven is defined as living in an incredibly beautiful world and feeling, you know, that everything that you do is meaningful, which it is, because uh, in a small world, there are no small actions. Everything has an impact. And 10% may be deprivation. You don't get to travel. You don't go to run out the airlock doors when it snows to make snowballs. And, you know, certainly the most difficult thing is only having seven other physical human beings to interact with. And in which way did this well, manifest the, itself? <laughs> oh, I mean, it, it manifests. Fist fights or? <laughs> no, the, there, were, there was a couple of uh, teacups thrown in anger, some peanuts A couple of people were spat upon. This I only learned from another one of the crew members' uh, book, you know, years later. But there was a power struggle on the outside. As Biosphere 2, first off, we expected it to be a very quiet research project uh, when we began it. That's why we picked this obscure place, Oracle, Arizona. Then it London. turned out to be a media spectacle. Yeah, it, it turned out to be a media spectacle, which had its downside and its upside. I mean, the upside is that we realized that we were in biospheric education big time. And we were presenting a beautiful image of the architecture was stunning. The biomes themselves, because they were taken care of meticulously with, you know, beyond loving care. It's not, it wasn't a pet. It was like Biosphere 2 was our life support system. And we loved mm -hmm. it. So it was a spectacularly beautiful world to live in. But the power struggle kind of polarized the crew. The one faction, which one wanted to make the project, let us say, more conventional science-y, they were trying to enlist the, the crew on, on their side. And then there was the others, and I mainly fell on that, that said, yeah, I know we're defying the usual limitations of specialist science, but this is a unique facility and we can do unique things. And I, I think the results validated that. I mean, the, the critics had said, it's too complex. You have to have simple systems. And, and I think we all learn 
this kind of BS definition of science is that everything is the same and you change one variable. Well, they were saying if we had a trillion dollars and could have built 10 biospheres, I would have been for it. But even building one took 10 years of effort. Yeah. Enormous. <clears throat> enormous. But, they, but uh, the critics, the specialist scientists said, well, you're not going to understand what's happening in there. Well, we had this surprise which ironically the mass media took as the proof of the failure that the oxygen unexpectedly dropped. In fact, that was a validation that, num number one, we had sealed the, the system incredibly tightly. I wouldn't have seen the oxygen decline. And then we elicited the interest of the first time that Columbia University got involved do the research to figure out where did that oxygen go. Cool. So there was, you know, beautiful and really elegant use of sophisticated isotope tracking and this, yeah. that, and the other, yeah. and some common sense. I, I mean, I love it that the the main researcher who is working on his PhD with this research, his dad was a construction engineer. And he said, ah, unsealed concrete. Maybe it's being absorbed in the concrete. And lo and behold... And we kept really good records that if we did a core of concrete poured outside in the normal CO2 environment and in the CO2 enriched environment mm -hmm. in Biosphere 2. So anyway, you that, that, you know, that to me was one, an illustration that even a simple, simplified biosphere is going to have enough diversity. And we know so little about how our biosphere operates that there are going to be surprises. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's an experiment. It's an experiment, so, yeah. Personally, what were your biggest takeaways from these two years? For me personally, it was a transformation. Because I think as much as I put my heart and soul into ecotechnics, into learning how to grow plants and trying to be cooperator with my environment, deep in magnitude inside Biosphere 2, this reality that we are not only not alone, we depend on every breath, every drop of water, every bit of food, everything on our living biosphere, that reality wasn't just some chatter in my brain. My body really got that. And I think that's amazing. When I think about how do we get people to really rise the challenge of preserving our beautiful biosphere, I think that understanding and embodying that connection is the most crucial thing. Yeah, Today it's run by the University of Uni Arizona? Yeah. It, w it went through a stage where it was uh, operated by the Columbia University, and they unfortunately had no interest in a closed system. Like They wanted to transform the facility more focusedly into a global climate change, and they wanted to manipulate CO2 levels rather than have the system produce its own regularities. So they stopped it being a closed system, and they tried to study the biomes individually. And they did some some really landmark studies with the coral reef. So Columbia ran it for about eight years or so. Then there was a period when its future was in doubt. And now the University of Arizona both owns and operates it and is doing some really remarkable research with it. You've just been there recently. Yeah. So what do they do? Well, you know, the best thing that they're, they're doing, which was our original dream, is they're, they're manipulating experimentally the rainforest area, this half acre rainforest, basically based on a neotropical and Amazonian model. They're both manipulating that and then doing comparative studies in the Amazon mm. to get insights into, for example, they can, you could produce a drought inside Biosphere right. 2 deliberately and intensively study not only individual plants, but ecosystem, whole system responses to it. And mm -hmm. I think that they're intending to do that with the mangrove area, another area I really love. The desert looks good, but they're going to reconfigure the ocean to study another type of uh, marine system. At least part of the mission was yeah, achieved yeah. with the experiment. And people also, they focused so much on the first two years, which was really just the shakedown. It was built for a hundred year experiment. Yeah. 
I think it has a good chance of doing that. I really hope that people get inspired and we do get a bias for three, four, five. Mm -hmm. And what we still envision is since biospheres are so incredibly important, and now as we degrade and endanger our biospheric health, that comparative biospheres could also give us insights into how to better manage our relations. Yeah. That That's why, and people kind of overlook it. I, I think Biosphere 2 is a success even before the two years because we actually designed a technosphere. Absolutely. That fulfilled its role. And What kept you going over all these years? I think the, you know, one of the magics of Ecotechnics is always increase the challenge so that you're not just repeating yourself. Mm. And it helps if you take on projects that no one else, conventional economics and conventional mm -hmm. approaches kind of don't cut it. You have to be creative uh, about it. The fact that we're always kind of trying to raise the bar. What are you currently working on here at the ranch? We do have economic uh, viability challenges here and there. We're in the middle of rebuilding the Heraclitus and getting it to uh, be seaworthy for a few more decades of marine research, oral histories, cultural documentation of sea people. Oh, we have a project in Puerto Rico, which has spawned a really beautiful enterprise demonstrating that Puerto Rico produces really beautiful wood, but the land that we chose has been devastated by two hurricanes in the last six years. So that's a uh, eco-geotechnical challenge uh, mm. itself. Yeah. And on Wastewater Gardens, we have a project in Jalisco for a village, uh, but even more challenging, we're trying to do the first large constructed wetland and wastewater garden in southern Iraq yeah. for eight to 10,000 marsh Arabs. Oh, we've only had our main ally kidnapped and threatened with death if he continued working on, on, on the project. On the other hand, the Minister of Water Resources cut the ribbon for the first part of the project, which the Iraqi government has paid for, and he wants them all over the country, which was our intent. If you have five words to describe the spirit of the people here, what would these five words be? Courage, improvisation, putting your whole being into what you're doing, synergy, being willing to listen to other people and integrating with a bigger whole, And I think also exploration. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for listening and please stay tuned for the next episode of the Synergia People Podcast 2023.